Hey, and welcome to FISM News. I'm Samuel Case. And I'm Renata Kish. And tonight, Israel recovers the bodies of six hostages in Gaza. Meanwhile, border apprehensions skyrocket at the northern border. And Kamala Harris launches a pro-abortion bus tour in Florida. Hello, we hope you had a wonderful Labor Day weekend, but we do sadly have to begin today's show with some rather tragic news coming out of the war in Gaza over the weekend. That is, Israeli officials confirmed on Saturday that they have now recovered bodies of six hostages recently killed by Hamas, including one American. It is with a heavy heart that we share the news that the bodies of six Israeli hostages who were all taken hostage alive by Hamas during the October 7th massacre and murdered in Hamas captivity were recovered from inside a tunnel in Lafa and have been brought back to Israel. At this stage, we assess that the hostages were murdered by Hamas terrorists shortly before our soldiers were able to reach them inside the tunnel in Lafa. Autopsy findings show they were shot multiple times at close range only days before their bodies were found. In a statement, President Joe Biden said he was devastated and outraged by their deaths, especially the the, uh, death of American Israeli Hirsch Goldberg Poland. Vice President Kamala Harris also released a separate statement condemning Hamas as an evil terrorist organization with even more American blood on its hands. Meanwhile, the IDF says more than 100 people are still being held captive by Hamas. And as six more hostages were found dead in Gaza, Israeli protesters took to the streets once again to put pressure on the government to reach a ceasefire deal. The country's largest trade union organized a general strike in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv on Sunday, which was still in effect yesterday. According to Reuters, the protests inhibited traffic and medical services, while many shops and businesses were also closed due to the labor union's call for demonstrations. The strike stopped after Finance Minister Bazal Smotrich called on the labor union to stop the unrest because their protests were largely political and not economic. The labor union complied and the protests ended yesterday afternoon. Now this all comes as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu heavily criticized the UK for pulling back some of their military aid from Israel a day after the hostages were recovered. He called the country's actions shameful and criticized their tactic that he says will only embolden Hamas. At the same time, Joe Biden is also ramping up the pressure on the prime minister in light of those hostage deaths. Returning from a two-week long vacation yesterday, the president said Netanyahu just isn't doing enough to secure a hostage deal with Hamas. Mr. President, do you think it's time for Prime Minister Netanyahu to do more on this issue? Do you think he's doing enough? No. Now, Netanyahu quickly responded to Biden's comments there, saying Israel has repeatedly shown its willingness to make a deal. On August 16th, Israel agreed to what the United States defined as a final bridging proposal. Hamas refused again. On August 19th, Secretary Blinken said, Israel accepted the U.S. proposal. Now Hamas must do the same. On uh, August 28th, that's five days ago, five days ago, Deputy CIA Director said that Israel shows seriousness in the negotiations. Now Hamas must show the same seriousness. Netanyahu also expressed his frustration that Israel is now expected to make concessions to Hamas, which just murdered six hostages. We're asked to show seriousness? We're asked to make concessions? What message does this send Hamas? It says, kill more hostages, murder more hostages, you'll get more concessions. The pressure internationally must be directed at these killers, at Hamas, not at Israel. We say yes, they say no all the time, but they also murdered these people. And now we need maximum pressure on Hamas. He said, quote, I don't believe that either President Biden or anyone serious about achieving peace and achieving the release, that is, of the hostages, would seriously ask Israel, Israel, to make these concessions. We've already made them. 
And unfortunately, back in the U.S., in some more disturbing news, Jewish students are facing unspeakable harassment at Columbia University. A faculty-led task force against anti-Semitism released a lengthy report on Friday detailing Jewish, exp uh, Jewish students' experiences on campus. The authors wrote that students described being shoved, pushed to the ground, berated for showing support for Zionist causes, and watching Israeli flags burned. They added that Jewish students recounted seeing drawings of swastikas in their dorms, students yelling pro-Hamas chants, and being denied access to public spaces and opportunities simply because they were Jewish or Israeli. The report said many of the agitators are a part of the Columbia University Apartheid Divest, an organization overseeing more than 100 student-led clubs leading this hateful behavior. The report blamed the university's failure to enforce standard decency policies and for letting rule breakers go free without punishment. The task force concluded by compiling several recommendations for policy change at the school, and some of these are mentioned as trainings against anti-Semitism and embracing pluralism. And up next, migrant apprehensions skyrocket at the northern border. We'll be back after this. Tragically, and all too often, a young mother in an unplanned pregnancy is in crisis. Pressured from others and without the support of the father of the baby, she feels alone. Compelled into making a heartbreaking decision, she will regret her whole life. But she is not alone. You can be there for her by giving a life-changing ultrasound through Preborn. Seeing her baby on ultrasound is a game changer, doubling the chances she will choose life from 40% to 80%. For only $28 a month, less than a dollar a day, you can show a mom her baby on ultrasound. Your love can save a preborn baby and give a lifetime of joy. Give your tax-deductible gift today. Call pound 250 and say the keyword baby or donate securely at preborn.org forward slash TV. Well, in our journey through history, let's explore one of the most famous physical pieces of history in the world. This structure was the original sports arena, as it were, at least in the Western world, and it would serve as a model for modern age professional sports stadiums. Now, the sports that took place in this stadium, though, were vastly different from baseball or football. They were life and death battles, killing for sport and for entertainment for the Roman aristocracy. To watch more episodes of A Moment in History, go to FISM.TV. What can you tell our listeners about the benefits of being a partner? It's blessed me with an opportunity to help further the kingdom in a small way, which matters a lot because God takes small things and makes them big. The blessing really has been to be able to take care of my family, but also take care of the kingdom. Going to bed knowing that not only are you correctly managing your investments, but you're doing it in a God-honoring way. Welcome back to FISM News, I'm Renata Kish. Well, let's continue our coverage with some news at the northern border, where a record number of illegal immigrants have been arrested in the past 10 months. Just the news reports that the Swanton Sector Border Patrol agents have apprehended 50,000 migrants from 85 countries coming to the U.S. through Canada since last November. Based on past records, this year's data shows the greatest number of illegal immigrants crossing within this time frame. For comparison, back in 2021, there were only 365 migrants from the north arrested in total. This comes as the Biden-Harris administration has insisted that border numbers are down since the Trump administration, a false claim fact-checked by Center Square. Since 2021, when Biden took office, the number of illegal immigrants has only increased. Something we've covered quite a bit here on our show and shifting now to international coverage for today. That is apart from what's going on in Israel. We'll start in Ukraine, which is now accusing Russia of targeting a hospital in Poltova earlier today, striking a military training facility in the area and also attacking the hospital itself. President Volodymyr Zelensky says that the attack killed over 40 people and injured 180 others. It comes amid some of the heaviest Russian bombardments of the war so far. Missiles also struck a shopping mall in Kharkiv on Sunday, injuring nearly 50 people there. Meanwhile, Ukraine launched a massive 
drone strike of its own early on Sunday morning. Russian officials say they've destroyed more than 150 of those drones, but said that falling debris ignited fires at an oil refinery and also a Russian power station. Meanwhile, a helicopter crash that killed Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi back in May was allegedly caused by weather conditions. That's according to a final report released this weekend, which cited complex climate conditions in the mountainous region. Investigators noted a sudden dense fog at the time of the accident, and the report further says they found no signs of sabotage. Rumors of an assassination attempt elevated regional tensions following the helicopter crash. The former president's funeral was marked by Iranians chanting death to Israel. And still in the Middle East today, U.S. forces on Sunday captured an ISIS leader who recently helped five terrorists escape a detention facility in Syria, three of whom still remain at large. In a statement announcing his capture, U.S. CENTCOM explained a primary objective of ISIS is to now free their captured fighters to, quote, fuel an ISIS revival as over 9,000 ISIS detainees are in custody across more than 20 facilities in Syria. CENTCOM Commander General Michael Eric Carilla said, quote, if a large number of these ISIS fighters escaped, it would pose an extreme danger to the region and beyond. This comes as ISIS now thre uh, threats, that is, have been on the rise following the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Most recently, an ISIS-affiliated stabbing spree in Germany left three people dead there. The group also connect, uh, a group, the group was also rather connected to a failed terror attack in Austria, targeting a Taylor Swift concert, which the CIA said could have killed tens of thousands of people if it actually had been carried out. And along the same lines, attackers in Turkey assaulted two American soldiers yesterday in the port city of Izmir. The service members were wearing civilian clothes at the time, but were identified as soldiers on board the USS Wasp, an amphibious assault vessel uh, scheduled for a port visit. The U.S. Embassy to Turkey confirmed the soldiers were okay after other military personnel intervened. Police also responded and detained 15 people connected to a Turkish nationalist youth group that's known to be anti American and pro-Palestinian. A White House spokesman said he was troubled by the event but praised the Izmir police for taking the matter seriously. And before we go to break here, the U.S. has now seized a plane used by Venezuelan president and dictator Nicolas Maduro for violating U.S. sanctions. That seizure comes as the U.S. claims Maduro stole his re-election back in July, saying his opposition is the rightful winner. The U.S. seized the plane in the Dominican Republic yesterday and has since flown it back to Florida. The Justice Department said it was illegally purchased and smuggled out of the U.S. last year. The White House National Security Council called the seizure a, quote, important step to ensure that Maduro continues to feel the consequences from his misgovernance of Venezuela. And we have plenty more news to get to coming up next. We'll be right back after a moment in history. Welcome back to a moment in history. I'm Seth Udinsky. Well, in 1683, Christendom stood on the wrong end of the proverbial sword of Islam, so to speak. And this was not merely in the 17th century, actually for a thousand years, Islam had, with some interruptions from time to time, grown like a deadly disease through the Middle East, North Africa, and in the previous 200 years into Eastern Europe. Having taken down the once mighty Eastern Roman Empire in 1453, the Ottoman Turks were pushing further into Europe, raping and murdering as they went, and reaching the gates of Vienna by the 16th century. If they succeeded in penetrating Western Europe, Christendom itself would fall to the Arabs. Well, in 1683, Vienna stood on the brink of destruction as a massive Ottoman force numbering as high as 200,000 loomed over the city facing down a far inferior Christian force defending it. The Ottomans were the latest Muslim foe to force the Christians on their heels, and Christendom, having been weakened by its own series of internal religious conflicts in the previous century and a half, was down to its last breath, so it seemed, until it wasn't. Unbeknownst to the Ottomans, a mighty force of Polish knights was charging down from the north, led by an old but mighty Christian king, Jan Sobieski. Now, Sobieski was a pious Christian and a defender of the faith. He was enraged at the incessant push into Western Europe, and he had gathered a force of 20,000 elite Polish fighters to give assistance to the Holy Roman forces desperately trying to defend their capital city. 
Now, among these 20,000 were an elite force of knights armed with beautiful silver plate armor and emblazoned with wings on their backs as if they were themselves an elite angelic fighting force. They were the winged hussars. Old Sobieski descended with his mighty cavalry on September 11th, 1683 to attack and penetrate the side of the massive Ottoman army. Though the Hussars were vastly outnumbered by the Ottomans, the Hussars, christened by some as the Angels of Death, were essentially an elite strike force that would hit their enemy so hard that even a larger force like the Ottomans could not match their might. Now, understanding the vitality of this battle for his people and for his faith, Sobieski charged, followed by his faithful hussars in full gallop to slash the flank of the Turks. The Turks stood no chance and they were obliterated. There was no stopping Sobieski and the hussars and the Turks suffered massive casualties that day. Sobieski said in the letter following the battle, quote, we came, we saw, God conquered. Though the city of Vienna was badly destroyed in this battle, the remaining Christian survivors celebrated the great victory that day. And of course, that day, September 11th, 1683, was the day the furious tide of Islam was turned for good. A mere 250 years later, the Ottoman Empire lay dead on the ash heap of history, conquered by the British Empire at the end of World War I. Thanks so much for joining me once again for a moment in history. Navigating through investment options can be challenging, especially when you're determined to uphold your God-given values. Every dollar you invest is a vote for the world that you want to live in. Let your values guide your investment decisions and help to shape the culture in which we live. Become a beacon of light and pave the way with biblically responsible investing. Timothy Plan, where faith and finance collide. Before investing, carefully consider the fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the investment company. This and other important information can be found in the fund's prospectus. To obtain a copy, visit timothyplan.com or call 800-846-7526. Read each perspective carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. When a woman experiences an unplanned pregnancy, she's faced with a difficult decision. Preborn connects with life-affirming pregnancy clinics across the nation and provides them with free ultrasound sessions for expectant mothers. When a mother sees her baby on an ultrasound and hears their heartbeat, it doubles the chance she'll choose life. Visit preborn.com slash life to save a baby's life. Fear and uncertainty can cause us to hold things tightly and rely on ourselves. But during uncertain times, as believers in Christ, we are called to surrender fully to our sovereign God. Learn a biblically responsible investment strategy proven over 25 years. Keep the money God has entrusted to you out of companies that participate in things that God detests. Fully surrender. Become a Financial Issues Partner today. to FISM News once again. I'm Renata Kish. Well, let's start off with some national coverage. Democrat VP candidate Tim Walz's campaign motorcade crashed on a highway in Milwaukee yesterday, leading to minor injuries for some of his staff and press members. According to on-site reports, paramedics examined one staff member for a broken arm, while two press members walked away with scrapes and bruises. A third reporter considered going to urgent care for a suspected concussion. Deadline reports that the crash happened when a press van slammed into another campaign vehicle in front of them and then was hit from behind. The remaining vans, which included Walls and his wife, were unharmed and continued their journey to a Milwaukee labor fest where they were set to make an appearance. The Democrat candidate said at the event that he was relieved to hear reports of minor injuries and that the people involved would be okay. Vice President Kamala Harris and President Biden were briefed on the incident. They then shortly contacted Walls to ensure he and his team were fine. 
And we're glad to hear that he is okay and that all the minors, uh, all the injuries were minor, that is, and we pray that they recover quickly. Speaking of the Harris campaign, it is uh, now launching a so-called Reproductive Freedom Bus Tour starting today in Donald Trump's hometown of Palm Beach, Florida. The campaign says the tour will make at least 50 stops across multiple states over the next several months for the rest of the campaign. Along the way, the campaign surrogates will tout Harris's plan to restore Roe v. Wade abortion protections into federal law. The campaign says the tour will also focus on holding Trump, quote, directly accountable for the devastating impacts of overturning Roe v. Wade, including threatening access to IVF. But despite these claims to the contrary from the Harris campaign, Donald Trump has repeatedly expressed his support for IVF. In fact, he recently suggested federally funding the treatment, which has caused quite a bit of a controversy. FISM's Ian Patrick has more on that. Republicans are coming out in droves to comment on former President Donald Trump's take on IVF treatments. Specifically, Trump said last week that his administration would look to provide some type of financial support to cover the cost for the rather expensive procedure. Under the Trump administration, we are going to be paying for that treatment. So we are paying for that treatment. All, all or Americans we're going, who want it? All, for all Americans that get it all Americans that need it. So we're going to be paying for that treatment uh, or we're going to be mandating that the insurance company pay. Since then, other Republicans have commented on this platform. Senator Lindsey Graham, for example, told ABC News' This Week program on Sunday that he does not support the private health insurance coverage. Instead, Graham floated a different idea. We've been accused, the party has, of being a bit against birth control. We're not. We've been accused of being against IVF treatments. We're not. And one thing I thought about after what he said, you know, we have tax credits for people who have children. Maybe we should have a means-tested tax credit for people using IVF and other, other uh, treatments to become pregnant. I would support a tax credit uh, means tested, kind of like we do with children. That makes sense to me to encourage people to have children. But you wouldn't support this idea of mandating insurance companies to cover this, would you? No. I mean, you've already voted no, against it. Because there's yeah. no end to that. Yeah, there's no end to that. But another Republican, Senator Tom Cotton, said that he is at least open to Trump's proposal. All Republicans, to my knowledge, support IVF in the Congress, and there's no state that prohibits or regulates IVF in a way that makes it unaccessible. It is expensive for many couples. I understand that. So it's something I'm open to that most Republicans would be open to. I think we'd have to evaluate the fiscal impact, whether uh, the taxpayer can afford to pay for this, what it, if, impact it would have on premiums. But in principle, supporting couples who are trying to use IVF or other fertility treatments, I, I don't think is something that's controversial at all. The conflicting nature of these opinions reflects a bigger fight within the Republican Party on IVF, or in vitro fertilization. The GOP has struggled to find a completely unified platform on the subject in the post-Roe America. As you just heard, some are unsure how it should be financed, but even then, some disagree with how the procedure disposes of unused fertilized eggs, while others don't see it as much of a problem, at least when compared to abortion. And speaking of abortion, Trump also made headlines with a comment he made on Florida's proposed abortion law. That proposal would undo the state's current six-week fetal viability law. Trump had said that six weeks was too short in comments made last week, and many took that to mean that he was voting in favor of this proposal. But Trump recently went on to Fox News to clarify his position on the matter, claiming that the Florida proposal could legalize abortions through nine months of pregnancy. I think six weeks, you need more time than six weeks. I've disagreed with that right from the early primaries when I heard about it. I disagreed with it. At the same time, the Democrats are radical because the nine months is just a ridiculous situation that where you can do an abortion in the ninth month. And, you know, some of the states like Minnesota and other states have it where you could actually execute the baby after birth. And all of that stuff is unacceptable. So I'll be voting no for that reason. This is Ian Patrick reporting for FISM News. Thanks for that report, Ian. And while Trump has been criticized by social conservatives lately, he is still very much in support of parental rights based on his appearance at the Moms for Liberty conference this weekend. 
After highlighting his disapproval of school boards across the nation, Trump said he is for parental rights all the way. You know, I'm, I'm for parental rights all the way. I don't even understand the concept of not being. Thank you. And, no, but when you see some of the Neither things... Neither do we. You've got to give the parents... The parents truly love the kids, okay? Some of these people on the boards, I think they don't like the kids very much, what they're doing. So you have to give the rights back to the uh, parents. When commenting on the FBI's crackdown on conservative parents at school board meetings, Trump said he would make sure he changes that on his first day in office. They called us domestic terrorists, President Trump, Can for you believe speaking it? out at school board meetings. Well, we'll our change kids. that on the first day, I promise you. Trump also confirmed that he supports vouchers for private school tuition and other parent-friendly policies. The Christian Post reports that over 1,000 schools are okay with withholding information from parents concerning their kids as of this reporting. And it looks like Donald Trump is right to make education a major issue this election cycle, as new data from the Center for Education Statistics shows a third of American public school students performed behind their grade level at the end of this last school year. June's data reveals no major progress over the past two years to close learning gaps caused by the school closures during the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, the gap has actually widened in three of four regions, with the Northeast in particular seeing the largest decline in student performance. Meanwhile, nearly 80% of schools also at the same time reported chronic student absenteeism as a major problem last year. So it makes sense that Donald Trump is trying to capitalize on on these things. It's right. probably a very smart thing to do. Yeah, and I think it's an important topic for mm -hmm. the upcoming elections, yeah. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, lastly, 10,000 hotel workers went on a strike this holiday weekend after contract negotiations with three major hotel chains broke down. On Sunday, workers at two dozen hotels owned by Hilton, Hyatt, and Marriott went on a strike, demanding greater wages and job security. The hotel workers' union initially targeted facilities in eight cities. Baltimore hotel staffers joined in earlier today, and the union says it is prepared to expand the strike to three more cities. Hyatt blasted the union for choosing a strike while the corporation was willing to negotiate. The union originally said the strike would end in each city after a maximum of three days, meaning many workers should return tomorrow. Well, hopefully not too many people's Labor Day vacation <laughs> plans were ruined by that. Right. It could be incredibly frustration, frustrating. You try to go to a city and Definitely. nope, all the hotels are striking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially for the hotels mentioned, I yeah. think it was quite frustrating to lose out on all that money. Yeah, very, mm -hmm. very frustrating. <laughs> all right, well, that's our program for today. Thank you so much for joining us and please visit FISMnews.tv for more content. And for any updates until our next show, follow us on social media at FISM News on all your favorite platforms or you can download the FISM app right to your smartphone. Take us on the go. Thanks so much. God bless and we'll see you tomorrow night with more news coverage. Fear and uncertainty can cause us to hold things tightly and rely on ourselves. But during uncertain times, as believers in Christ, we are called to surrender fully to our sovereign God. The call to surrender to Jesus is one step in our growth in holiness. And it doesn't just mean you give over a few things. It means He gets it all, including our finances, our investments. Learn a biblically responsible investment strategy proven over 25 years. Keep the money God has entrusted to you out of companies that participate in things that God detests. Fully surrender. Become a Financial Issues Partners today. Learn more by going to financialissues.org slash join. That's financialissues.org slash join.